This lecture will introduce you to the cestode tapeworms and will give you the example of Diaphilobothrium latum, also called the fish tapeworm. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. I want you to get familiar with the structure and classification of the tapeworms. The fish tapeworm is a prototypical one and understand its life cycle so you can break that cycle. Know who gets the infection and be able to make a diagnosis depending on how it shows up in your practice and based on the testing that you'll do to confirm your suspicion. As always, become familiar with treatment options. Here's our tree of life. We're still in the helminth section. The cestodes or tapeworms are here. And what's interesting about these cestodes is that they all share the same basic structure. First of all, they have a head. We call it a scolex. And the head has suckers to hold on to your intestines. And in some cases, it actually also has hooks to augment that holding power. Just below the head is the neck. That's what we call a generative area, and the neck will bud off individual segments. The segments are called proglottids. The proglottids make a long chain, and the chain is called the body, or strobilia. Each proglottid has both male and female gonads. These are self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. The ones that come off the neck are immature, but by the time you reach the far end, which can be meters away, they are filled with eggs and are pregnant ready to reproduce. There's an egg coming out of the end of that worm. So the paradigm is that most of these tapeworms require more than one host. There's the definitive host. That's where the adult lives in the GI tract. By adult, we mean it has sex. And this is the host that will pass eggs in its stool. And then there's the intermediate host. By definition, the intermediate host ingests the eggs that come out of the definitive host. This is where the larval form will develop in the tissues of the body, and the life cycle is closed when that definitive host eats the tissue coming off the intermediate host. I'll give you some examples. If this is confusing, don't worry. It's actually very straightforward. So humans can be the definitive host of Diaphilobothrium latum and Tinea saginata. D. latum is the fish tapeworm. T. saginata is the beef tapeworm. We can be the intermediate host of Echinococcus. That's the dog tapeworm. And we can be both definitive and intermediate for T. solium. That's the pig tapeworm. So let's start with the fish tapeworm today. Here's the life cycle. And it starts when this individual eats uh, undercooked flesh of a fish, a fish that spends most of its life in the fresh water. Inside the flesh of that fish, there is a parasite called a pleurocircid. It's basically a tiny little worm uh, with just a few segments to it. And once that flesh makes its way past the stomach into the small intestines, uh, it will hatch out of the cyst that it's in and hold on to the small intestines and just begin to grow. Over several weeks, it will turn into a full-fledged adult. And thereafter, its whole job inside the body of that individual is to grow more and more proglottids. The more proglottids it makes, the more likely it is to be able to complete the life cycle because the life cycle is completed when this person defecates into the water. When their stool gets back into the water, eggs will hatch. They will become active. They'll be hoovered up by this little plankton-like microscopic organism. It's basically like a water flea, uh, which we call a cyclops. And that cyclops becomes parasitized itself. What a fish eat, they eat little bugs in the water. When they do that, the fish becomes parasitized and uh, is then ready to complete the life cycle. In the case of Diphilobothrium latum, the adult has a head with two suctorial grooves, or bothria, and that's where the name Diphilobothrium latum comes from. So this is a zoonosis. It's an infection that's shared with fish that spend at least some of their time in the fresh water. Salmon is one of those. The spread is by fish to mouth, not fecal oral, and the worms can live inside the adults for up to several years. Again, as usual, the egg has to get out of the human body in order for the life cycle to complete itself. Now, who gets this? Well, at a glance, you'd say you have to eat freshwater fish, but it's more than that, right? You have to have freshwater fish, poor human sanitation, where people are defecating into the water. You have to have a lack of an inspection system or safety system for the fish meat. And you have to have cooking practices where people aren't cooking their fish. And this happens culturally across the world. It could be gefilte fish, lutefisk, sushi, anyone who tries to salt their own fish may do an inadequate job of that. This means that millions of people are infected worldwide. This is a common issue. So how does it show up? Most people with Diphilobothrium latum have no symptoms whatsoever. 
Once in a while, someone will pass an entire proglottid or a segment of the strobilia body per rectum. If you look in the toilet and you see one of these long chains coming out, that will usually get your attention. Now, that's when people will bring you the worm. Sometimes you'll have to make the diagnosis because they'll have a vague syndrome of diarrhea, belly cramping, maybe anorexia. Now, in even more rare cases, there's a serious consequence to this infection, which is called megaloblastic anemia. Megaloblastic anemia you will learn about in your hematology section, but in summary, it happens when the body is deficient of cyanocobalamin, vitamin B12. When you don't have enough vitamin B12 in your diet, the bone marrow is unable to form uh, white cells and red cells appropriately. And if you look on a peripheral blood smear, what I'm showing you here, you can see that the red cells are bigger than they should be. And some of the polymorphonuclear leukocytes are hyper-segmented. They are deformed and they don't work properly. So that's a problem because you don't have enough red blood cells and they're of a strange shape. But even more concerning, the brain doesn't function properly without B12. This can lead to early onset dementia. It can look for all the world like Alzheimer's disease unless you make a diagnosis based on their dietary history and confirm your suspicion in the lab. To make that diagnosis, number one, have they consumed raw or rare fish recently? And did they pass a worm from their butt? That makes it easy. If they haven't done that, you should still do a fecal, ova, and parasite. Check the poop. Submit a specimen, look at it under the microscope. If you see these eggs, they have a little hatch on the top called an operculation. There's really nothing else that looks exactly like this. You have confirmed your suspicion. Once in a while, it's found to great excitement of the gastroenterologist when they're scoping a patient for, say, GI upset. Well, there's your problem. You can see the strobilia right there in the small bowel. And yes, the hematologist will make this diagnosis too, based on the fact that they may see someone for megaloblastic anemia. If you measure the level of B12 in the body, it will be found to be low. Now, most of these patients will not have an eosinophil elevation. Eosinophilia happens when worms migrate through your tissues. In this case, the worms are basically staying in the gut. They should not elicit a big eosinophilic response. What do we do when you make a diagnosis? Regardless of how you've made that diagnosis, just kill the worms. We use a drug called Praziquantel. It's very effective against virtually all of our uh, tapeworms. And in this case, uh, just a short course should be very effective. If patients have a low level of vitamin B12, give it back to them in their diet. And then of course, break the cycle. And try to work to improve sanitation for your patient or the community where they live. And uh, on a public health basis, we need to do a better job inspecting these fish, getting people to cook their fish better. And there's also a secret, which is that if you freeze the fish before you handle it, those pleurocircid larvae don't survive. So if the fish has been frozen, even for just for two days, it's much more safe to work with. So my key concepts for Diphilobothrium latum, or fish tapeworm, is that it's the prototypical tapeworm, a cestoad, and you get it when you eat infected fish. Anytime you have human feces in the water and then they consume raw fish, you can be at risk for infection. Most people are asymptomatic. Some will pass a worm, some will have a more vague GI upset, and on rare occasions, truly low B12 levels. Make a diagnosis by finding those proglottids or eggs in the stool, looking for megaloblastic anemia, or measuring B12 levels in the body. We treat these patients with praziquantel, and we prevent this from happening with improved sanitation, better fish inspections. If you're ever in doubt about this infection, cook the fish. Thank you for your attention.